I really express my gratitude to Karnataka uh, Science and Technology Academy for giving me this opportunity to teach the PUC students. It is always, uh, you know, uh, very, uh, very engrossing and uh, very fruitful to teach uh, PUC students. So uh, today, um, what I would like to teach is uh, there is a chapter called Atoms you know uh, by uh, in your syllabus as well so i would like to take up a part of it you know, maybe i don't know whether how much uh, justice i can do for that but i would like to take it and uh, present it to you today so that is uh, the bohr's atom uh, model so that would be my uh, topic for the day so i would like to share and in between, if you have any doubt, whatever, you feel free to uh, ask me. You can uh, put it in the chat box. You can uh, do that. Okay. Right. So, see, uh, Bohr's atomic model. So, why it should be? There, see, uh, all the earlier models like uh, the Dalton atomic model was there. Then, uh, you know, the there were some experiments. So, this is the Bohr-Rutherford atom. Actually, it was started by Rutherford and then, you know, modified by uh, Niels Bohr. Even though the uh, spelling you see a little bit differently than you see in your uh, uh, textbook. It is written like how we pronounce it. So, see what happened was when people were thinking that uh, a atom is the smallest, per, uh, you know, entity, or that is the brick by which all materials are built. In 1895, Thomson discovered electron. So he showed, uh, this is a very a famous experiment by J.J. Thompson. And he, uh, by connecting a high voltage and uh, in very low pressure, high pressure, he had, he could vary the pressure of the gas. You know, what you should understand by varying the pressure is less number of uh, molecules of the gas or more number of the molecules of the gas. So like that, you try to understand the pressure. Low pressure means imagine that there would be less number of molecules. So what he observed was that there was a ray which had these cathode rays as they were known as. So they had negative charge, very, very small mass. So that was discovered, you know, there were methods to find out the mass. So you should not think that uh, how could they know all these things. Uh, in fact, there is uh, a method to measure the charge to mass ratio of a, uh, any particle by Thomson's method itself. So there it was, and it was very, very, uh, very, very light particle, you know, extremely light. So now the question comes. So that means to say now, atom has negatively charged particles. And uh, that means to say, since atom as a whole is electrically neutral, it means that there should be positive charge also. So uh, how many negative charges are there? That many positive charges also should be there. Therefore, now you have to imagine now. So how are they, you know, arranged this positive and negative charges? So how are they arranged? So that would be, you know, getting into the model of atoms. So how are they being arranged? So this positive and negative. Remember, atom, which is electrically neutral, but now from the atom, uh, negatively charged particles have come out with sufficient high voltage. When they were given, they have come out. So that means to say that much of positive charges also should be present. Therefore, now you have to think of a different brick now. So 
is this this was the first model known as the plum pudding model so people thought that since uh, atom has mass you know atomic masses were already determined by chemists at that time that means to say since electrons are they have very low mass so one can conclude that positive charge carry the most of the mass of the atom okay so how they could be arranged so this was one model you know like in a sweet so you have a porridge and imagine that there would be raisins one of the rakshi so like that and what is the size of the atom it is only 10 to the power of minus 10 meter unimaginably small from human point of view from human scales but you should not think that it is a very small one and all see it all uh, uh, appears in from what frame you are looking into okay so this was the first model so people were thinking you know you have to because there is no way of looking into an atom so you have to do it through experiments indirectly so you should get an idea about the atoms but at that time rutherford did what is known as the alpha scattering experiment that is a very famous experiment and this experiment is the basis for both atomic and nuclear physics if you have to study nuclear physics this would be the first experiment and if you want to study atomic physics this would be the first experiment so we have a source of alpha rays what are alpha rays they are helium nuclei that means they carry a charge of plus 2 okay so they will come they are emitted they are collimated and then they fall on the target and they can be recorded on a screen falling on this now gold foil so there were two collimators so you can see that there is a film type and the alpha scattered can be collected you can imagine that when the alpha particle falls it would give out a flash so that means to say in the original direction if it goes no deviation if it is deviated then we say that it is scattered so you can see that most of them went unscattered but a few of them you know they were uh, a few of the alpha particles so you could see that here so you can see that yeah so a few of them through a very large angle scattering what do we mean by scattering we mean that to the original direction the uh, the alpha particle after hitting the gold foil you can see that gold color there so it comes uh, through a large angle it is deviated through a large angle so that we call it as you know scattered so if it goes without any deviation it is unscattered so this was an experiment done so if you think of atom as plum pudding then you know all the alpha particles because alpha particle is also positively charged uh, the mass of the, the positive charge you know like plum pudding so all particles should have been deviated but it is not happening so that means to say only a very few of them are getting deviated therefore what is in this box now so uh, box means what is in this atom so that is what we would be looking into so what is in this box which is behaving in this way you see it is like that you are blindfolded you touch something 
and you know you try to uh, imagine how it should be you know by whatever suppose it is making some noise and all how you should be uh, you know uh, understand what it is so similar to that now you will find that what is in this box is all the mass spread like so of chocolate or is it concentrated at a ball bearing you know thick and at the center so you see your imaginations when you touch that okay in that box when this experiment was done now you cannot open the box because not only that we are not even uh, looking at what we have is only an idea we are hitting it and what comes out of it through that so what is that now you just shake so shoot uh, bullets randomly and if it is filled with soft chocolate all the uh, bullets will go straight without much deviation but if it is ball bearing most of them will go straight through without deflection but not all because see when it comes very close to the nucleus nucleus or you can say that that ball bearing where most of the see this is one imagination now that's it so if that is where all the mass is concentrated if you imagine like that then it appears as though the alpha particle which is positively charged and the uh, ball bearing which is positively charged so when it comes tries to come close to it it will be deviated so this is when large angle it would be deviated so now one imagination now comes to our mind so is our atom you know is it uh, planetary like then so that means to say most of the atom now you can think of it as an empty space that is why all the alpha particles shot through it walk in without much deviation and if at all they go near uh, the uh, you know uh, the electrons electrons mass is very very less so hardly you can expect any deviation but in case they go very near to the uh, positive charge then because of like charging repulsion there would be lot of scattering because gold nucleus you know it's very heavy compared to uh, the alpha particle which is plus 2e and gold is uh, 79 so you can imagine that so this model looked possible you know so most of them if it is the empty space they will walk through and uh, positively charged dense central nucleus if you imagine very few of them getting scatter so this was a possible model so rutherford used the alpha ray bullets and uh, you know alpha rays were coming from some radioactive element so at that time it was there so you can now understand why rutherford's alpha ray scattering experiment is very uh, it is known as the starting for the nuclear physics as well because it can uh, it tells you about the nucleus also but anyway we are interested in the atomic model see for us definitely positive charge is there so that where all the mass is concentrated at the center or what that side whatever some of them uh, make elliptical orbits also so it is there and the electrons are evolving see because electrons are attracted they are negatively charged and they are attracted to the positively charged and if they go and fall on the nucleus then plum pudding model but plum pudding model is not stable alpha ray scattering experiment is not giving you those results how it should have behaved if you had thought of it as a plum pudding model therefore now this orbit looks you know possible so that model so that is why rutherford's model is like this now so plum pudding and planetary so only occasionally only occasionally only the alpha particle was scattered through a large angle therefore the planetary model somewhat looked possible 
but you know there the uh, uh, analogy ends because in a planetary model the attraction is because of the gravitational force but here that kind of uh, uh, that force is not there so let us see even if it is there gravitational force is extremely small so saw that one out of 10000 only alpha rays scatter at wide angles so that means to say in a planetary model so that, that is somewhere at the center very small this nucleus very heavy sitting that word nucleus was coined for the positive charge now you cannot say that it is a ball bearing so a neat word can be coined so that is uh, positively charged uh, nucleus is sitting and then uh, these uh, alpha particles that is why very few of them because its size is very small okay? so in fact um, rutherford by calculations that is different when you do nuclear physics you will actually see that rutherford did the calculation of the size of the nucleus and it turned out to be 10 to the power of minus 14 meter so that was the size of the nucleus so from there it was carried nuclear physics starts but now for us let that nucleus let it be there positively charged what is inside now we don't think about that as of now because for atomic model positive charge uh, negatively charged electrons going so we want to give explanation for some of the known phenomena like atomic spectra uh, some of these kind of things especially atomic spectra it has to be given okay now rutherford atom so now this is his imagination now so plum pudding model was a failure because of the alpha a scattering experiment so very small 10 to the power of minus 40 so that is the nucleus but all together you know these electrons going in orbits so this is not to scale obviously so the nucleus would be too small i will just give you in the next slide hope to give you an analogy uh, compared to the atomic size what would be the size of the nucleus so <clears throat> but see nucleus is so strange even though it is so small it carries 99.9% .9 of the atomic mass because uh, electrons are very light particles okay? but they are hold they are held together so uh, by this time uh, probably all of you are thinking because uh, this is positively charged that is negatively charged and they are uh, held by the electrostatic force of attraction you are very right so by coulomb's force they are held and if you are thinking on those lines you are very right okay so this is the size see and uh, with that size uh, you know nucleus what all it is doing right okay see it is like this now the size you imagine this is the atom size is some outdoor stadium you can think of it as kantirava stadium or ksc ksc stadium that cricket stadium imagine that atom size is that in that how the nuclear size will look like you know like a golf ball kept at the center all of you would have seen if if, if you have not seen golf ball imagine a ping pong ball kept at the center so that is the image you know the comparison between the atomic size and the nuclear size so ksea stadium at the center you have kept a ping pong ball let us say so that would be the relative scales all right okay but mass is all carried so you can imagine how dense the nucleus would be or it is it is so dense you can see this is only a model but experimental evidences point that this model gave out so many good results so that is the thing see, some uh, predictions came true that is why this model works okay so but you know when rutherford assumed like that 
that it is going because of the electrostatic force of attraction. See, when an electron is going in an orbit, example, Earth is also going in an orbit, it's being accelerated. The charged particles, when they are accelerated, see, Earth is not, we consider Earth to be electrically neutral. So when it is orbiting, don't worry about uh, uh, it radiating energy and all those things. But a charged particle, when it is being accelerated, what it does is accelerating electrons should radiate energy. This is classical electromagnetic theory. It tells you that classically, electro, you know, electromagnetic theory, whenever a charged particle is accelerating, see in a circular orbit, every point it is changing its direction so as a result every time it is getting see when acceleration happens when a when its magnitude changes or its direction changes it is being accelerated therefore electrons are being accelerated now this is rutherford's model i'm talking about so it should radiate energy and when it radiates energy, what happens? It cannot be in the orbit, that big orbit, far away from the nucleus. So its orbit will become smaller and smaller. And finally, it should fall onto the nucleus, the positively charged, a very dense nucleus. Then it will become plum, plum pudding model. But that is not so. Because atoms are very, very stable. Plum pudding model, you know, is not giving any experimental evidences for that. Therefore, now what should happen? See, this accelerated, it's giving out light and it should fall. So, it only survive for about 10 to the power of minus 12 second. But every experiment shows that electrons, uh, Rutherford atom is very, very stable. Most of the atoms, you know, they are very stable. Therefore, now what should be done? And not only that. Now, Rutherford model was planetary-like and all those things. There were other, you know, evidences. Like solar light spectrum. There were some uh, colors missing. Yeah? And some wavelengths were missing from sun's black body spectrum. And low-pressure gases, see, in our mind, it will be there. Any hot body should give continuous spectrum and all those things you have read. But when some elements which were in the atomic state, when they were excited, they never gave continuous spectrum, but instead they gave discrete lines, no specific lines. Back when the hydrogen spectrum was studied on Earth and the solar spectrum were compared, what was missing was obtained as bright lines in the laboratory. Therefore, so that means to say there were only specific lines. Yeah? So, classically, all uh, wavelengths should be present. But now, we observe that only certain wavelengths are present. So this was a pecu uh, peculiar result. Peculiar or unexplained, whatever you want to call it as. So there were only some specific. No? And there was a person by the name of Balmer who arranged all these and uh, he made uh, it like, you know, it, you, it gave in the visible region especially, all the known wavelengths of hydrogen atom spectrum. Okay. So you understand that what is a spectrum. From your high school classes, you would have studied that it gives out characteristic colors, any element when excited. So there is what is known as an absorption spectra. There is an emission spectra, all those things. So see, since we are going for this uh, atomic model, I am not going in detail for the spectrum. I uh, hope that those who are interested, in fact, all of you should be interested in all these things. You should read how a spectrum comes about. At least, classically at least, you should understand 
how a spectrum is obtained. Okay. So all these things, people have observed spectrum for a long time. They have observed. So in fact, it is a characteristic. It is a signature of an element. No two elements give the same type of spectra. Okay. So each element is characterized by its own spectra, whether it is emission or absorption. <coughs> okay. So it is characterized. So this classically, it was impossible to explain because all wavelengths should be present. But why only some wavelengths were emitted? So these were there. So at that point, Bohr, Niels Bohr, that famous personality, father figure to many of the uh, scientists, what he did was, this he introduced, you know, he took from Rutherford model itself. Okay. What he thought was, see, it is a good model because it could explain alpha scattering experiment. But only thing is now, it should not radiate energy when it is in an orbit. But when it jumps from an one orbit to another orbit, see, it's not that uh, an electron can, see, hydrogen atom has only one electron. It doesn't mean that it is forever bound to a single orbit. Yeah? So it is not like that. Uh, my question also would be there. Is the uh, Earth bound to a same orbit? Uh, think about it and uh, tell me afterwards. Okay, right. So, this electron now, see, when you give energy to that hydrogen atom sample, you know, it can go to a higher energy state also. See, because it has to take that energy and it will go to a higher energy. So, these are all orbits, as we call as. It can go to a different orbit. And, you know, it cannot be in that orbit itself. So, it will come back to the ground state. See, it is like this. Suppose you are very angry, let us say. See, you are, uh, okay, you are mild and all those things. But someone, you know, they excite you. You go to an angry state, let us say. And then again, you will come back to the ground state. So, like that. When come, coming back, it will radiate energy. All right. Okay, so it will radiate energy. As long as it is in the orbit, it will not radiate energy. This is a this was a hypothesis put forward. At that time, there was no experimental evidence. But since this looked like a very good model, he same Coulomb's law of attraction only everything, but only thing is the as long as it is in allowed orbits, there are only some orbits which are allowed. As long as it is in those orbits, it will not radiate energy. Okay. So you can now think of how it is possible in standing waves. You know, in standing waves, um, uh, in a wave concept, you will get that. That in standing wave, energy won't come out, isn't it? Okay. So, but Bohr never knew about those things. But he hypothesized that as long as they are there, they will not radiate energy. So, he introduced the concept of radiation-less orbits. So, they, were, they revolve but without radiating. But electromagnetic uh, loss, it was contrary to it. This was a hypothesis but it was working. Because the alpha ray scattering experiment force, it is like that. And when, because light has to be given out, because spectrum is coming. So unless light is given out, spectrum won't be there, light won't be emitted. So it occurred when an electron transits from one. So those allowed orbits are known as stationary orbits. So one state to another. So, depending upon the, see, some energies are there. So, depending on that, that kind of light is uh, emitted. So, when a transition, so from a higher energy to lower energy, so that is given out. The difference in the energy is given out in the form of light. 
So this was his idea. So you can see that these are all the allowed orbits. So that means to say the electron can be here. It, suppose it is in the higher energy state. So this is the ground state. This is the excited states. All of them are excited states. And when it comes from one uh, allowed to, then the uh, light is emitted. So this is. So absorbing the light, it will go. Light means energy, the photons. You know, photon concepts are there here. So the uh, you know particle nature of light we are invoking at this point. So it will absorb a photon, goes to the higher energy state, and then it it will come back to the lower energy state also giving out energy so this was the these are these are all allowed orbits when they are in the orbits they will not radiate so this is how it is so you can see this animation which is a good one so here how they are radiating so different energies okay? so uh, of course the electron, hydrogen atom, one electron would be there. So that would be in some orbit, orbit. Don't imagine that forever it will be in that same orbit itself. It will be going, depending upon its excitations and all those things, it will be coming back to the lower energy states and all these things. Okay. So it will go to the higher energy states by absorbing energy. So some somebody should excite it, maybe a voltage is given to the sample or it is heated. So you can imagine how it could be. So all these things. But now the problem comes. How? What is the condition? You know why you are stating that? Not allowed. See what Bohr did was, he took the concept of angular momentum. See angular momentum uh, many students, you 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 have studied it in your uh, first year PUC, in your uh, high school, and all those things. Okay, it is perpendicular to the ground. It is a vector. All those things. So the orientations of these orbits, you know, that is what this angular momentum would be telling you. What it says is that that condition was put. It should be an integral multiple of h divided by 2 pi. That means the angular momentum of the electron cannot have all the values, but it can have values only an integral multiples of h by 2 pi. Why? He, he Bohr's model, see at that time, he got the answers by giving it like that. Okay, see it is very easy to ask the question why. But you have to think about those things. People have thought why it is working. They have come up with the answers. Okay. Always you should ask first the question how. How it is working. Okay. For everything, not why, how. First, it should be how. How it is working. So, that means now integral multiple means not all values are allowed. So, when not all values are allowed, only some values are allowed means it is known as quantization. Okay. So, it goes in some steps means it is quantized. See, suppose you have a smooth uh, uh, escalator with no steps at all. So that is classical. If steps are there, that is quantized. So steps wise, it is going. All right. Okay. So these were the postulates of, uh, see again, I'm giving you. So angular momentum postulate. Angular momentum is given by MVR, where V is the velocity, R is radius of the orbit, M is mass of the electron, and NH divided by 2 pi. N is 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So it is, this condition was put, it worked. 
that's all one can say why or how he was uh, uh, it worked a uh, bor was not totally uh, he could not explain it totally but later on of course it was explained totally all right so when an atom when such type see this is the important first postulate of bor so not all angular momentum this angular momentum is very very important so it does not radiate energy and when it comes from one state to another see this is the important thing it jumps from an out higher energy orbit to a lower energy orbit the difference in the energy of those orbits is given out in the form of see these are the postulates that is what i was telling you so this is hf see light now not the energy of the light is not expressed in terms of wavelength amplitude etc not classically but it is explained in terms of planck's hypothesis by invoking light as a particle or as a photon light particle is known as a photon so that means the energy is hf where h is known as the planck's constant and f is the frequency of the radiation so uh, more the energy difference more will be the frequency less is the energy difference less would be the frequency so what are the two postulates of bohr the first one is uh, angular momentum quantization not all orbits are allowed but only those orbits which satisfy nh divided by 2 pi remember that planck's constant and angular momentum have the same dimensions both of them have same dimensions because h by 2 pi is a mere number therefore angular momentum dimensions only planck's constant also has and the second postulate is that it will uh, give out energy only when it comes from one orbit to another and that energy is given by hf that is the planck's hypothesis see are other postulates like it is going in uh, orbits and all those things these are the most important now using this what bohr did was bohr model of the atom he equated okay so what he equated so that means to say uh he uh, just uh, one second okay okay see now all of you uh you can observe that what he equated was it is a semi classical thing see what is that the centripetal force okay so this is very thick let me use a line so uh one second Uh, one second i would uh, cancel this uh, white board and then i will uh, okay okay
uh, one second, I would be Madam, sharing uh, uh, option is available, right? Ah, okay. Well, uh, my uh, this one is being shared, no? Yes, ma'am. Whiteboard. Uh, whatever Whiteboard. I want to close. I want to show the PPT itself. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Once again, you have to share. Yes, ma'am. I want to close this whiteboard option. Yes. When you try to share once again my that presentation, madam. Ha. Now is it okay? Yes. Ah, okay. Yes, but, yes, ma'am. It is fine. Okay. So. That is why I I would like to one second I would just write the first question this one I will open yes this one okay all right okay see one second let me erase all these things ah. see what is that now it is m v squared by r so this is the centripetal force. This is equated with 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught. That is the electrostatic force of attraction. So that is ZE is the charge of the Q1, Q2 divided by R square. So ZE is the charge of the uh, nucleus. And E is the charge of the electron divided by R squared, that is the radius of the orbit. So, this is the thing, okay? So, from this, you know, and using E2 minus E1 is equal to HF. So, and using MVR is equal to NH divided by 2 pi. See, I won't try to do the derivation. Derivations are uh, straightforward. So, what you can do is you can uh, simplify this n from MVR. You can sub, uh, substitute for NH uh, divided by 2 pi. Get an expression for the radius of the, okay. So, these things now you can do. See, this is the basic equation. All right. Okay. So he started, you can see that this is a semi-classical presentation. So now I will stop sharing this. Again, I will share the uh, PowerPoint, okay? Right. Right, okay. So that means to say now, See, radius, so that was the first. You can see that 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught value is this. Mass is this. So, these are all the things, you know, what we have considered. So, Bohr's first postulate, mv squared by rn, k is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught. It is written like that, ze squared by rn squared. Second postulate, so the radius was the radius of the orbit was n square h square divided by 4 pi squared k m e square z. So you can see that the radius is proportional to n square. The other things being constant, radius is proportional to n square. And velocity was again determined. It was found to be proportional to z and uh, inversely proportional to n. So this was. Found. So, the velocity of the electron in the orbit, uh, the allowed radius of uh, allowed orbit radii. So, these were given by using the uh, Bohr's uh, postulates. Okay. So, these were the things. Then, energy that is the most important thing. Energy of the Bohr's orbit, how do you determine? See, energy is how always it is given. It is given by kinetic energy plus potential energy. That is the total energy. So half mv square and the potential energy is given by kze squared by rn. This can be done very, very, in a very simple way. So this one. So that turned out to be minus half 
kz e square divided by rn where e is the charge on the electron z is the charge of the nucleus and k is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught the negative sign actually indicates that it is a bound system an atom is a bound system always remember that negative comes for energy means it is a bound system if it is positive means it is a free system so that should be there in your mind so this was the energy 2 pi squared k squared e squared z squared so that means energy is proportional to 1 by n squared so finally they found that it was minus 13.6 z squared by n squared so you can now you will be thinking uh, we were talking about hydrogen atom isn't it but you can think of it works for all hydrogen like atoms what do you mean by hydrogen like atoms all atoms which have one electron what is this how is it, how it is possible remember that atomic number is the number of protons so that means to say suppose you remove suppose you take helium atom you remove one electron from its orbit then it is a hydrogen like atom because it is only one electron suppose you take lithium and you remove two electrons from its orbits then it is again a doubly ionized lithium is again a hydrogen like atom okay don't think of alkali atoms alkali atoms don't have only one electron even though they have one electron in the outermost shell they are not hydrogen like okay similar uh, since all other uh, electrons are bound but you have to think like that so minus 13.6 so if you put n is equal to 1 then the ground state energy would be minus 13.6 and if you put n is equal to 2 that means this becomes 4 so minus 13.6 divided by 4 will give you energy of the second uh, orbit allowed orbit and so on and so forth minus 13.6 divided by 9 this is i am talking about hydrogen atom Likewise, you can find for helium, you can find for lithium, all these things you can do. Okay. So this was the, this was the energy levels now. So that is what actually people found, isn't it? So the hydrogen energy levels. See, if you put Z is equal to 1 here and all those energy energies you will get. Then when they jump from one energy level to the other energy level, the difference in the energy level will come out as light. So that means to say, when, when it comes out, you can match with the spectral line wavelength and they found to be exactly matched. So this was what was found. So this is how the hydrogen, uh, you know, I want to show this, uh, all the series. is radiated in the form of a photon having certain frequency.
So this is the important thing. And he, uh, he was able to give, uh, you know, Bohr's theory, uh, all the uh, spectral lines he could predict. In fact, many more series were predicted. All of them were found to be correct. So that is a very major success. He coupled uh, classical and quantum mechanical, and he was able to give. But what makes these energy levels, uh, you know, allowed? Another only two minutes now I will be taking. So this is the standing wave, you know. So if you think of electron as a wave also, so the dual nature of matter, only then you would be able to explain the allowed stationary orbits, not otherwise. Okay. So matter waves also, not only light exists as a dual nature of light, but matter also exists. So you can see that when it becomes a standing wave pattern, then that is a stationary wave. Okay, so that is the stationary orbits. So this is the de Broglie. So if they won't make an integral number of wavelengths, then it is not allowed. And only when it makes an integral wavelength, it is allowed. This is for completeness sake I'm giving. You in your syllabus, it is mainly up to Bohr's atomic theory, including the derivation. So you can see that this is how all the orbits you know, known number of integral number of wavelengths associated with electrons are, they make a standing part pattern. So this is how uh, the other one. So using this, Schrodinger wrote the wave equation for uh, electron. He got the energy levels. And, you know, don't worry about, uh, for completeness sake, I am giving this, that's it. So what you have to understand is once you think of electron as a wave also, then its location becomes very fuzzy. So in the Bohr's atomic theory, it was located very clearly, but uh, in quantum mechanics, it is fuzzy because it is like a wave also. Therefore, it can be found anywhere in that orbit. So that is known as the probability density. So this is what I wanted to say. See the derivation I haven't done. I'm sure that uh, with that all of you, it's um, algebraic uh, uh, things, so which you can do. And these are the problems that I wanted to give. And I don't know how uh, students would be able to copy this. Would you be giving them? Uh, just I wanted to ask. These were the problems that I wanted to give. We'll send them more of this screen thoughts will be shared then. Okay, this uh, will be shared no? to them. Okay. So, and uh, I thank all of you. And probably you will have uh, doubts also. But it, always think of how. Okay. Don't the question why come to you first? How? How this can be explained? This is happening. So, that is what Bohr did like that. So I am um, thankful to all the listeners and also to the organizers for giving me this opportunity for giving a presentation. Thanks one and all. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, I request you to please share that uh, previous slide, ma'am, to take a screenshot okay, of the sure, Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, okay. Now, uh, I request uh, students or teachers, any of you have, if any questions, you can please raise your virtual hand or you can type the questions in the chat box so that you can discuss the same thing with madam to get clarification on your questions. If there are no questions, we will formally end the sessions. Uh, and you can contact us uh, if you have come any if any queries comes or doubts comes, you can contact us. Uh, we can get back to Madam through email or contact number so that. Uh, uh, meanwhile, if any uh, other information, please let us know. And uh, I request all the attendees to give your feedback also by going to our website and uh, uh, share your uh, views on the session.
Uh, and uh, now I would like to conclude the session, today's session. Uh, since there are no questions from any of the audience or students and the teachers. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank you, madam, for accepting our invitation and delivering today's session of atoms with the thematic uh, presentation way. Thank you very much, ma'am. On behalf of uh, ASTA, on behalf of all the audience, students and teachers, thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll thank be you very contacting much. Thank you. you. Thank you. Yes, okay. We'll be communicating yeah. with you, madam, for future uh, presentations also, future programs also. Sure. Yes. In sure. association with KSTA. Mm. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Thank also, you. Also, I would like to thank our mm. KSTA fraternity and KSTEPS fraternity. Mm. Uh, and, I didn't uh, get that. There was some. Uh, can you repeat that? Last but not least, I would like to uh -huh. thank uh, all the audiences, the students, yeah, yeah. teachers. Sure. Students, yes. teachers. Mm. Okay, ma'am. Okay, thank also, you. I would like thank to thank you. students. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Students and uh, okay. teachers uh, who have joined with us in this WebEx platform and YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you, one and all. Thank, thank you, you, madam. I take leave of you now. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Thank you.